actually recording her. So hello and welcome. My name is Ron Herman and I'm the chair of the photography department at Foothill College. And I'd like to welcome you to this event, the artist talk with Arthur Tress. So let me give you a little story. I, when I was in undergraduate school, studying photography, I went and would just stay in the library for hours, just pouring over photo books. And I came across the books of Arthur Tress, which blew me away. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. This guy was so imaginative. I was like, what is going on in this, in this guy's mind? I mean, the images were just so inventive and in how he was dealing with fantasy in this surreal way. So fast forward to 2015, um, I actually get to meet Arthur Tress at an art opening in San Francisco. And there I am standing in front of one of my photo icons. A, a few days later, I'm there in his home, pouring over some negatives and some vintage prints from his archive. And then I come home with one of his iconic images. So there's few times when you, when you get to meet one of your photo icons and they live up to the pedestal that you put them on. But he in fact is one of those people. I'm so excited that he's here to share his work with all of you guys. I'm so, so pleased to see that so many of you have joined us today. Um, his work is in every major um, museum collection, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, MoMA, Whitney Museum of Art, the Smithsonian, the Getty, uh, the Pompidou in Paris, the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago, the George Eastman House, San Francisco MoMA, LACMA, I'm in Los Angeles, the Museum of Fine Arts, I'm in Houston, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, and his archive is in the Stanford University Library collection. So it's available for people uh, to enjoy and to learn about the life and photography of this amazing photographer. Um, just a note that this presentation is intended for a mature audience and it does contain um, some nudity. So please be mindful for those who are in view of your computer screen. And please join me in welcoming Mr. Arthur Tress. Okay, thank you, Ron. That was a very nice introduction. Uh, the picture on the screen is a recent self-portrait that I did about three years ago. Uh, I'm holding my Hasselblad camera. I still use 120 Tri-X film, Kodak film. I still manufacture it. And uh, I, I just feel comfortable using the analog techniques because it's something I've done for many years. Uh, and uh, I think photographers should occasionally do some self-portraits as time goes by. And uh, I, in recent years, I've kind of gone back to simple seeing, just kind of trying to see what's there and uh, how interesting it is in itself. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, I'm 82 now, but I grew up originally in Brooklyn, near the Brooklyn Museum and the Brooklyn Public Library. And uh, I could go by myself to the library and I always loved picture books. So that's me in the middle with the curly hair <laughs> and uh, looking at a book of Audubon birds. So I always, uh, I wasn't really like other kids, you know, playing baseball and street games. I was always a little introverted and like, like being by myself. And I think uh, that you can see that in my work a little bit. Also bird imagery 
it's something that's very pervasive, flying, etc. in a lot of my work as a symbolic image. Next. Uh, I began photography in high school and I did a self portrait of myself with the tie and the shirt when I was 17 and in my home room. And I just seemed to have had a natural talent for photography. At that time, I was using a roller cord camera, which also is two and a quarter square. And I thought I'd recreate the moment. So this I did in 1995, which is already 25 years ago, amazingly. So I, I guess I was younger. And uh, so I'm just holding up the portrait of myself that I did when I was 17. And there's kind of a spiral movement to the image. And I think our lives are kind of like a spiral that as we go forward, it's really not linear. Our lives are kind of touch parts where we've already been. It's kind of a continuity. And so I like this picture kind of very much. Okay, next. Uh, I, asked, I met Kache Bresan in Kyoto, Japan, where I was studying at, a, uh, at the Zen Study Center. Uh, and uh, we exchanged some Japanese books, but we had a little correspondence. And uh, he always felt that he was a surrealist, even though we think of him as a kind of wonderful photojournalist. But um, he, I asked him what surrealism was. And he said, uh, go look at the manifesto of surrealism of Andre Breton, which was uh, a small book that I knew already, whose emphasis is when on the dreamlike, on the strange combinations of the ordinary when two distinct realities sort of come together accidentally. And that's something you find in Bresson's photographs. And certainly as a street photographer, one's always coming up against these interesting juxtapositions, accidental chance meetings in the street. So uh, he had a big influence on my early work. Next. Uh, I, I was living in New York and it, in the uh, late 60s and early 1970s, everyone was kind of doing street documentary, photojournalism. And uh, that was the style I wanted to work in, black and white but my pictures were a little, sort of came from a different angle than the usual documentary photographs of the time, kind of Magnum style. So this is a photograph. I went up to 110th Street in Spanish Harlem in New York and on Halloween. And I asked these two kids to pose for me uh, in their Halloween costumes. So it has a very kind of odd quality that really was be to become the trademark of almost all my work. Uh, at the time, uh, around 1970, there was this new awareness of environment and pollution and congestion. Uh, and uh, so I worked on a project for the Sierra Club called Open Space in the City, places where you could make parks and uh, playgrounds. Um, the, what's shown in the background is the Gowanus Canal in Brooklyn. And I suppose now 50 years later, it's all fixed up. It's condominiums and you can swim in the, in the canal so uh, 
our first awareness of these problems eventually led to some good results later on. Okay, next. At, at the exhibit, I had uh, architects plans, how you could make mini parks, small parks, just on regular streets. And this, this, this park by Paul Friedberg was actually built in uh, Brooklyn in a poor black neighborhood. Next. So I would wander around the city and again, that kind of surreal juxtaposition of the mural and the figure walking, the, the alienation of people uh, sort of became a theme of my work. Next. I like there, the clocks have two different times. This was up in the Bronx. I, I just, I had a map of the city and I just wander around. I call them walkabouts. I, I've been exploring amazingly San Mateo in a similar way. Even now, uh, I go to the San Mateo College uh, swim club three times a week. And I just, part of my personality is always to be exploring new places. But there's a kind of a somberness, a kind of a sadness to this photo. Next. Again, I was very concerned with urban renewal problems and uh, tearing down of local neighborhoods to build these mammoth uh, skyscrapers and displacing people. But again, uh, in high school, I studied graphic design. And uh, so my Photos always have this kind of very poster-like simplicity. But again, it's a very strange moment. I did ask the woman just to hold up her arm. And, you know, that was going against the grain of Carche Bresson kind of street photography. You didn't ask the people to pose for you. But I, it was something that I was just edging into. This is a wonderful photograph of a family on the Bronx River having a picnic and uh, the child doesn't seem to be very happy, but um, it's kind of an amazing photo. <laughs> uh, again, uh, I began to be interested in the psychological aspects of family relationships. And, and couples. So uh, it became a theme of almost all my work. Next. Again, here's another family in uh, Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn. I don't know, you know, being a, a photographer at that time, I, I'm usually a kind of shy person, but when I have the camera in my hand, it opens up, uh, a kind of boldness in me where I can just go and, and photograph people that I don't know and they let me do it, it always amazes me. And I, I think I capture something interesting. It's also my photography maybe uh, is a reflection of you know, my own dysfunctional family, my parents divorced when I was 10 or, or 11. So uh, I think I project that feeling onto other people a little bit, which is what makes for good photography. When you put some of your own personal uh, drama into the, into the image. Next. This is under uh, the Whitestone Bridge in uh, the Bronx. And again, my documentary photos were just almost unconsciously becoming more dreamlike and surreal. And sometimes you can see the reflection 
of a skull in the shadow of the boy's face on the water. And I'm using a very wide angle lens. So uh, you get the whole panorama. Also, I began around this time, 1970, reading a lot of Carl Jung, and he's dealing with archetypes and things like bridges and gates and doors and staircases. Architectural elements take, began taking on a kind of symbolic dreamlike feeling for me. Next. Uh, this is from the Open Space in the Inner City series. It was just, I mean, the city itself can be very surreal. Here's a young woman sunbathing on a, a broken piece of pier. And, but it's very dreamlike at the same time. Okay, next. Again, the idea of sleep and dream, the child lost in another world. Next, here's a similar image. Next, uh, I did a workshop with uh, Richard Lewis on children's dreams. Richard worked, has something called the Touchstone Foundation, which still exists. He's an educator and he works in public schools giving workshops on promoting, stimulating creativity in young children. And one of his themes was getting them to write poems and paintings about their dreams. And he brought me into the workshop to photograph the kids doing that kind of stuff. And I brought costumes and we made a little book, but it gave me enough, my own idea to do a book on children's dreams. And I did a lot of research. I asked my friends what dreams they remembered from their childhood. Sometimes I'd ask children and I, would, I myself would do some dream workshops in public schools. Uh, but this is just uh, New York in a very poor neighborhood called Hell's Kitchen, Ninth Avenue, uh, where they play a lot of hockey. And this was a young boy uh, trying on his older brother's hockey gloves. But I played it, I trying to make it into a very kind of sacred feeling. It's just a wonderful photo. Okay. And again, this is the beginning of Dream Collector. The painting, you know, in a vest pocket park playground of this young girl with kind of the moon shape in the background. Next. Again, I began tying in some of the dream themes with the themes of environmental pollution. So you would get this kind of, uh, kind of surreal, but at the same time, making a comment, a social comment on pollution. This is the Passaic River in New Jersey. And usually I would just improvise with things that I found on location. Like there was this old muddy duck decoy and the colander and kids were always playing in the area. So they just became my spontaneous models. Next. Uh, I've always liked artists like Goya and Thomas Nast, uh, the German expressionists who did social commentary with their work, political commentary. Uh, so there were some riots around 1969 in Newark, New Jersey, where some buildings were set on fire. So I went a little while afterwards and began exploring sort of the burnt out riot area. And uh, I 
found this old burnt out furniture store and these kids were playing there. And I set up the ad advertisement, the painting for the furniture store. I put it up on the wall and I asked the young man to put his arm on the sofa as though he was actually leaning against it. And that kind of became my first stage photo where you can't, where reality and artificialness are combined. You can't tell so much. So that, that opened up a door for me to kind of further explore that world. Next. There are kind of, uh, one of the first surrealist paintings, Gregorio de Cherico, he did a lot of dreamlike landscapes based on Italian architecture and where you had a lot of receding arches and plazas. So this is under the arcades. This is under railroad, railroad trestles in Staten Island. I love going to these kind of urban fringe areas, urban wastelands. <laughs> You even have them here in San Francisco, even in San Mateo, one can find them. Uh, they're kind of disappearing, but that have this kind of on the edge uh, feeling. Next. I love this photo. It's never really been published. Uh, in the sixties, I ran the Bard College uh, cinema club and we'd always would show the films of Ingmar Bergman so he was a big influence on me of course and he was very interested in dreams and magic but here is this kind of kid just playing with his trucks uh, with the George Washington bridge in the background but well, once having an accident next again uh, this is really from the Open Space Project, but it's seg segueing into the world of dream. Uh, the man encased in smoke, just walking down the street. Next. So uh, I began making lists of dream themes, falling, flying, being chased by monsters, being bitten, uh, etc. And uh, I had an exhibit of them at the Rafi Photo Gallery. There were really not many photography galleries in the world at that time. Uh, and they, they actually became a book called The Dream Collector, which is 60 photos with some text about the dreams. Next. This is kind of a found image. This was a little boy that was being buried in the sand like all kids like to do in Coney Island. Uh, and again, uh, it was something that I just found. I asked him to open his mouth a little bit like a Mayan sculpture. Uh, and it just became a very strange moment. I love that moment when the ordinary day shifts into something extraordinary and sort of out of this world. In other words, the way I go through the world is kind of, it's not like I'm in a trance exactly, but I'm kind of in a different zone than I think than most people, especially when I have my camera in hand. Next, again, these, this, this is just some kids playing hockey on a city street and the smoke coming from the vent. But I'm very interested in masks. Uh, I've studied a lot of primitive and ethnographic art and uh, the way putting on a mask makes the person very like a god or a demon, makes, takes them into a different realm. Okay, next. 
Again, this is Halloween in Spanish Harlem, but the having the excuse of doing dreams kind of really opened myself up to new themes that weren't really the ordinary street photography. Next. This around 1970, there was the open schools movement. So I had access, I did a few workshops with kids in those schools. It was kind of a progressive education with a lot of emphasis on the arts, but the upper part of the school was uh, all these old classrooms. So I took these two kids and uh, had them posed like this. And of course, that's a very frequent dream theme, Oops. failing at an exam, taking an exam. And uh, so a lot of people are kind of, uh, can relate to this photo. Okay, next. Uh, when I was doing these dream workshops, uh, I would ask some of the kids if they remembered what their dreams were. And this was a, the dream of a little boy who had just moved to the city. And he was originally from Iowa or a place like that. And he often dreamed of being chased by farm machinery and kind of chopped up. So uh, we recreate, I found some vinyl panel cords there and we kind of wrap up him up in that. And kids are very good actors. They, they totally understood what I was doing. And it's really that kind of fear and anxiety is really part of their world. And uh, so next, this is the San Francisco Aquarium. Uh, I just asked this girl to lean up against the tank and these, so it had a very kind of underworld. It's, it's an amazing photo. So just improvising out of the, the very normal situation that sort of segues into something otherworldly, it sort of became my way of working. Next, again, the theme of being chased by monsters. There used to be a dinosaur park in uh, Santa Cruz in Felton. So, you know, just, you know, roadside attractions, amusement parks, abandoned amusement parks, country fairs, freak shows, all these kind of things. Uh, one could find dreamlike elements already waiting for you. Next. One of the themes of the dream collector is catastrophe. The surrealists love catastrophe, which of course we're having a lot of now with climate change, because it kind of turned things upside down. And this was after a hurricane in Biloxi, Mississippi. And uh, I brought my friend, uh, that's sheets of music just all on the ground there. And uh, the young boy was just playing there in the house. And then my friend uh, was wearing a musician's tuxedo. So we kind of created this very interesting, uh, mysterious situation. And I have to tell you, uh, this work was not accepted at the time. People still wanted the street photography and you, you weren't supposed to be doing this kind of photography. You wouldn't see this at the Museum of Modern Art or uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Now, of course, doing what you call staged or directed photography is very accepted and it's, more, it's what people do now quite a bit. But I was kind of one of the first people on the edge of doing that. Okay, next. 
again, this is a kind of a social commentary. This was after, uh, I think, uh, after the death of Martin Luther King, there were some riots in Boston and some burnt out buildings. And that's why the TV set was up on this hill. And I asked this young kid to get inside the, the TV set. He had the gun himself and he was just playing on the hills there. And uh, so again, it's a dreamlike photo, but it's also kind of making a commentary perhaps on violence and gun use in the United States and the world of children. Okay, next. This is probably the most famous photo of the series. It's called Flood Dream. And again, uh, there's the Jersey Shore, which has lots of old uh, amusement parks. Oh, a little bit like Santa Cruz, I suppose, or Huntington Beach, but they were all kind of run down. And I went in the winter time that, for that very uh, abandoned quality. And in the background is a ferry boat that had been uh, rescued, I guess. And they were going to make a restaurant and, on it, but it had been abandoned. And there was this uh, roof, just a roof on the pier. And uh, so this young boy on his bicycle was riding back and forth and he's actually just standing on the pier. And again, it's just this wonderful wide angle lens. And uh, next, this is the contact sheet. A little bit to show you how I work. Uh, you can see the roof and, and gradually around image 12, which is on the upper one on the left. That was it. That was the good image where right? I sort of moved in close and showed the whole scene. So you can see how these photographs are kind of improvised out of a kind of a playfulness. Uh, next. Again, uh, this was just from wandering around the city. There was a uh, baseball stop and uh, these young kids were climbing on it. And I, uh, and I'm, I just asked, directed them to, so that they'd look like a flight of birds flying. Again, there's no darkroom manipulation. Everything is just found. And it sort of became flying dream. Next. Uh, this is 1970 in Central Park. And there was a bit to the left, there's a big fountain. I'm sure you all know it, Bethesda Fountain with the lake. Uh, but at that time, on the weekends, it sort of became an area for hippies and people to come and gather in costumes. You know, this was the years of uh, like Haight Ashbury, the, the love in and all that. So there was this fellow in a big black cloak and there was this child. I do ask their parents uh, who was playing nearby if I could borrow the child and this little boy. And it's, it's a very terrifying photo. Now, what does this say about my own childhood? But uh, we can get into that another time, but um, it just became a very strange photo. Again, a little bit like Ingmar Bergman. There's a, a poem by Goethe about a child that's kidnapped by death. So it, it, it's a lot of people find this very disturbing but moving photo. Again, just improvising out, out of elements that I found that day. Next. This is a little bit more elaborate. This was uh, 
what do you call it? a fundraising haunted house uh, day and in Cape May, New Jersey, maybe it's Delaware, on that same trip that I did the flood dream. And these were people who were the hosts of the haunted house. And I just asked them to pose for me. And uh, again, with the wide angle lens, trying to set up these very archetypical relationships. And that has kind of a strange quality to it, for sure. Next. Again, the word um, nightmare comes from the German word nichtmar, which means a horse pressing against your chest, causing you not to breathe. So again, that was on my list to uh, recreate. I'm wandering around uh, the Bronx, which has some very pretty forested areas. And there was a, on the side of the road, there was a, a broken hobby, plastic hobby horse. And again, there was this kid just playing around and I asked him if he'd sort of get under the hobby horse. And I explained to him what I was doing and he, uh, he, he acted out these kind of terrified feelings of that. Next, uh, I had read about in the New York Times a uh, mansion uh, on the upper Hudson River that had all these wonderful, that they were trying to preserve, a family was trying to preserve it. And uh, so I knocked on this door, I, I took the train there, and I knocked on the door of this old Hudson River mansion and this young girl came out in the dress, not with the mask. And she gave me a tour of the house and up in the attic, we found this old St. Nick uh, mask. And I asked her to put it on and, and so she was fine with that. But again, it's a very disturbing, terrifying image in some ways. Next. This is uh, the Staten Island train service. Staten Island, I love going to Staten Island. It was like New York in the 1940s. So they had this old train that went around Staten Island and you could fold the seats over. And um, so I just asked this teenager to put his hand under the seat. So it seemed a little disembodied. Uh, opening this week in a, an important museum, the Museum of Modern Art in Lausanne, Switzerland, they're going to be showing this photo in an exhibit called Surrealism and Trains with a lot of uh, the most important 20th century surreal painters, Magritte, de Cherico, uh, Dali, and my photo, this photo will be amongst them. So you can look that up online. Okay, next. Again, this, this very strange, I was in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, where they have a uh, lab, a ecology lab, environmental research lab. And for some reason, they had this uh, stuffed American Eagle on one of the lab desks. And I asked them if I could take it out into the parking lot. And I set it up and this young girl came by with her family. And again, I asked them if I could pose their daughter with the eagle and they were fine with it. And again, it becomes a very disturbing dreamlike photo. Next. Uh, this is the Bronx Zoo. This is the children's zoo <laughs> in, in the Bronx. Again, it was closed down, but myself and these kids were playing inside it. it no, uh, and I asked him, uh, obviously the uh, zoo 
was they, they had wrapped it in plastic for the winter, but I asked this young boy to, to get underneath the plastic. And uh, so again, it's a very strange image. Okay, next. Again, the theme of catastrophe and disaster. There was a flood, talking about cl early climate change, and in Pennsylvania. And this is downtown Pittsburgh, and the river had overflowed. And this uh, young boy uh, was just playing in the mud. He was having a great time. And I asked him to pose. And it's again, it's a very disturbing image. Okay, next. Uh, I have to be going quicker here. Uh, this is Coney Island. But the, these images of, of oppression, there's always, it's very, they're very uh, disturbing, but at the same time, up to date, you know, they, they relate to some of our anxieties of today very much. Okay, next. We're gonna have to go a little quicker. So next, so you can see this theme of oppression and dream uh, in this group of photos. Again, which were very unusual for their time. And uh, the, uh, they're sort of, this was again, I just bought two artichoke roots and I brought them down to the park to photograph as a still life, but then this boy came by with his friend. I just asked him to put the roots inside his jacket and asked his friend to sort of run in the background. And again, it's that Kafkaesque feeling of transformation. Uh, okay, next. This is my, I grew up in Coney Island where I began my first photographs. And this is an amusement park that had been torn down. And these kids were playing. They, they had colored their faces with white chalk. And uh, this is the, the old ruins of Steeplechase Park. And again, of course the dog, so I like combining an accidental element. So the dog was just walking there, that was their dog. And again, it has references to Egyptian art and whatever, but next. Again, continuing this theme of dream and next. Uh, I, I found that mask of the Chinese boy's face in a trash can. And then I just asked this Chinese boy, this is in Chinatown, New York, if he would put it inside his jacket. And again, that idea of that there is an inner personality and the mask-like of the face. Next, a boy on railroad tracks. Next, Th those are loaves of bread. This was, uh, New I don't know, just New York at that time, you could find a mountain of bread just in the street somewhere. <laughs> so, uh, next. Okay, so then I did a book called Shadow where I took several thousand photos of my own uh, self. I had become friends with Dwayne Michaels who uh, is a photographer that does sequences. He sort of, uh, and writes with his photography which was kind of a no-no at the time. But this is an extended sequence of a hundred photos, all using my own shadow. I'm holding the camera in, with the wide angle lens in my left hand. Uh, and uh, he sort of became my mentor and encouraged me to get away from the photojournalism and start photographing what's inside me. And, 
uh, my personal views rather than the external world so much. Next. So you kind of have to see this as a book and I, it's online. Next. So it's, it's a very elaborate story, uh, kind of a shamanistic vision quest. Again, the theme of flying. So that's all me. And then he climbs mountains and has all kinds of adventures. And then he becomes pure light at the end of the sequence. Next. Sort of searching. So this, oh, uh, Shadows was after, after Dream Collector. And uh, next. So uh, recently San Francisco MoMA did a wall about a, of a hundred of these all in little frames and it really looked wonderful. That was about two years ago, but that's me with long hair. Next. And it, it, it evolved different uh, fantasies. This is the Minotaur fantasy and the labyrinth, all kinds of dream and vision quests uh, images. Next. Uh, it's a rite of passage. The shadow chases his childhood away, which is also uh, a, a, a strong theme in uh, tribal rituals becoming an adult. Next, a shadow is vampire. Next, uh, and this is where the shadow is becoming light. Uh, th there's a little bit of dark room manipulation where I just would make my shadow part kind of lighter and the edges darker. Next, yes, he's kind of traveling the world Next, uh, again, my next project was Theater of the Mind. And I decided to do the psychological traumas and dramas of adults. So we can look at this book. Next. Oops. Again, this is a, a young woman cleaning out a chateau uh, pool uh, and she's holding a fish. Again, it became very dreamlike. You know, I was just walking on the grounds like any tourist, but uh, I think the world of Tress, again, it comes, it sees things at a slightly odd angle. And, uh, That's all I can say. I don't know. It's what I'm stuck with. Next. <laughs> but I became very interested in family relationships. You know, uh, that's a brother and sister. He's dying of a childhood disease. They asked me, he had just caught that fish. And they asked me to, this is on Montauk, Long Island. They asked me to do a portrait. And again, of course, it's very touching because, uh, He's quite ill and uh, uh, next. Again, uh, this is a, uh, a daughter, Hannah Stewart and her mother. And they're kind of, uh, this is in Sag Harbor and uh, how the, the mystery, I, the mystery is how I got this older woman, you know, they're from an upper class family <laughs> uh, uh, to get her to let, be in the barrel, in the wheelbarrow. And there is a certain amount of truth. Uh, Hannah, the daughter who never married and uh, was kind of waiting for her mother to die so she could get on with her life. And 
So I, I have a little kind of intuitive psychic power about things that I, I often just guess what the relationships are. But you know, I, I've looked at a lot of film noir and things like that. So that feeds into my sense of what, what relationships are. Next. This, this is a little out of focus, but it's it, the scan. But uh, this is my friend from high school, Eddie Berman, who had moved to Oregon, but came back to take care of his aging mother. That's, that's a cold iron, don't worry about it. But afterwards, he liked this picture because he said his mother would let him uh, do anything he could to her. And it's Coney Island, she's living in, you know, public housing. Next. Again, this is my sister and my father. And uh, again, I often tell students that they should photograph their own families. Uh, and it's, it's not easy to do. My sister was, it turns out, was a, uh, a major gay activist in the 50s. And they recently did a Hulu FX channel documentary on her uh, in which I'm talking about her. She's in the background here mm. of my screen. Uh, she left me her house in San Francisco where I'm now living. And we can talk about this uh, a little bit later. Next, this is a portrait of my father. I uh, took this chair, which I still have here in San Francisco, out into the park and the snow is coming down. It, it's a, a very scary, I call it last portrait of my father. Next. This is also a very famous photo. This is in a, uh, this is Stefan Brecht. Uh, he was an actor and poet. He's the son of Bertolt Brecht and he lived in the West Village and uh, this church had just been vandalized and burnt down just next to his house. So he had this costume and uh, uh, it's a man on one side and a bride on the other, bride and groom. And it's a vaudeville act where he kind of dances with himself. So it became a very almost religious icon type image. Next. Again, it's similar, the balance of male and female, Mercury on one side, Aphrodite on the other, and the hermaphrodite in the middle. Uh, it goes back to the Jungian ideal of male and female aspects combined in one person. Okay, next. This is a sweet photo. Uh, this lady was, you know, living in, in uh, upstate New York by herself. I felt she was a little lonely. So she, we, she had this plastic chicken. So I just took, took that as though that was her only friend. Next. Again, I'm starting to use props quite a bit. This is Mickey Mouse, a fellow who collected Mickey Mouse things. Next. Again, I'm sort of, this is a mother and son in Princeton, New Jersey. And uh, I don't know, I used to, how I get people to do these things, but uh, I smile a lot. <laughs> Something mischievous about it, but they do. So somehow as I was doing the adult uh, imagery, obviously, uh, uh, sexuality and erotic ideas start to come into play. Okay, next. Again, th this is called Au Par Girl. She was French and this is Houston, again with this wonderful wide angle lens. And that's the son and that's the mother who might be. So I was just creating these little uh, pulp fiction psychodramas. <laughs> and uh, next. I went to a 
yoga conference on Paradise Island uh, to photograph, you know, the yoga people. But actually, the people who worked in the casinos in, in the Bahamas were more interesting than the yoga new age people. And so she was a uh, chorus girl and her boyfriend was a coupier and his hobby was, I guess, making taxidermy turtles. So their, their house was filled with all these stuffed turtles. So again, just not centering myself being outrageous, you know, seven turtles and this beautiful woman. Next. Again, this, uh, this is Bob Leet. I met him in San Francisco. He was my boyfriend for a couple of months. And he had this uh, sheep. It's a stuffed sheep. It's a toy sheep. <laughs> and uh, again, that very dreamlike quality of what's real, what's unreal. But again, uh, bringing, exploring sexuality and our erotic fantasies. So I said, well, what should be my next project? This is around 1977. And um, uh, young women as part of the feminist movement had begun doing the male nude. It's unbelievable, but at that time, there was very little male nudity being shown in any gallery or publications. So I kind of guess began doing it. Next. And this actually is, uh, this is more from the Open Space Project, but this was two teenagers. And this goes back to my own adolescence, I think, but I'd have crush on like, Herman the pole vaulter, that kind of, you know, your, your teenage crushes of someone who's more athletic and, and good looking. Okay, next. So I began uh, around 1977, 78, there were, you had Maplethorpe doing uh, the male nude, the gay male nude, and actually, this guy, Peter, is, was one of Maplethorpe's models. And uh, so I began doing it myself, but also it was part of the process of coming out as a gay photographer, you know, because I began publishing these photos and books and showing them in galleries and uh, giving talks about them. And, uh, and sort of my idea was maybe to go into a darker zone than, you know, Maplethorpe's a little bit too perfect, too studio. Uh, and, uh, and also this began saying things about my own self, my own sexuality, uh, at being a gay person. Next. Again, this, this is a, a very provocative photo, you know, his, there's no one in the boot oppressing him. The oppression is in his own imagination. And so I began again, making some kind of social commentary uh, about different aspects of gay life. Next. Uh, I've never had a studio. I always used studios in abandoned buildings that I found. So I found an abandoned railroad YMCA. And uh, I get models. I, there were some nude peers in New York and I just go there and find models and bring them into this railroad YMCA. <laughs> and I had all these props and there were the old offices and again, the, the figure on the desk sort of comes from Michelangelo, but uh, the guy with the book is kind of, actually he's an actual banker, but he's into uh, leather. And so it's a very peculiar 
combination of uh, an erotic feeling, uh, oppression, making a social comment. Uh, for me, it, it's open to several levels of interpretation. Next. Uh, I had become part of the New York City uh, underground theater movement. And that's my friend Elmer Klein on the left. He was a playwright. That's Tom O'Horgan studio who uh, created hair. And uh, so again, it's, it's, it's one of my first nudes. It's a coming out nudes. Okay. This is Minette. She was a transvestite chanteurs, chanteuse, and um, that's uh, uh, Brooklyn Heights. What was wonderful about New York, you really could, at that time, you could get an apartment for like $200 a month. I mean, the buildings in the background now are all condos, of course. Uh, so again, that very strange-like quality of Minette and the leaves and the boa. Next, sorry to keep moving on. Uh, this is this is Alan, and he he was into this kind of uh, leather thing, fetish. Uh, it's kind of wonderful, and uh, so. You, you can see that kind of strangeness that's continuing the dream collector themes, but, but coming into more uh, gay themes, uh, themes of, I worked a lot for Christopher Street Magazine and was able to sell these pictures. Next. Oh, then I did a book called Elmer, where I, Elmer's an older gay man but, uh, and this is out in Sag Harbor, Long Island. And I went to an antique store, we gathered all these props. The Elmer is father time. And I, I'm probably what, 50 when I'm doing these. So I'm becoming aware of time and getting older myself. Next. That I took an eight by 10 photo I had done of Elmer uh, and I put it into the stuffed chair. So it's not a double exposure. It's just where I re-photograph uh, an old, another photo. It's, it's called singing chair. Hmm. Next. Around 1982, I stopped photographing people with this photo. I said, you know, I began doing still lives. And I did that for the next 20 years. Uh, and I could make a living, by the way, you have to do that as a photographer sometimes, uh, doing still lifes for book covers. I did, I did lots of famous detective story novels. Uh, and so it kind of worked. I, could, I also did Rolex watches, but in a kind of surreal way. Next. Again, this is, this is, I took this Victorian uh, wall sculpture and just placed it in the waves and the waves are washing over it. I never do, you know, this is before digital, you know, I never did any dark room manipulation. Next. Then I moved to California <laughs> and the work kind of changed. You know, this is my friend Tobern, who has a, an Arabian horse farm in Watsonville. And uh, New York actually had changed. You know, it was like every place, you know, it was just become for rich people and it was much more crowded. So I just took a chance and I rented a, a small house in Cambria, California, near uh, Hearst Castle. And I've lived there for 30 years. And so the work becomes more involved with landscape, uh, perhaps more sentimental, more romantic. But uh, so this is kind of a wonderful photo. Next. 
Again, using still life and re-photographing things. Next, that's Santa Fe. This, so I'd fill up my car with all these props that I had bought at flea markets. Like this is a Yosemite in the winter time. Next. This is Hawaii, where those volcanoes are. Oh, this actually, we're back in New York. In other words, that's the same room where I had photographed the nude guy, like the Michelangelo, but now I created a kind of robot kind of secretary, an automaton. So I, I was really enjoying this new world that I had opened my, for myself of sculptural still lives. Next, towards the end of that project, I, I began, I got interested in a Russian constructivism and Bauhaus photography, photography done in the 1920s and 30s, more abstract. And so I began exploring this area of work which I still do quite a bit of now. Next. Again, you know, I've studied a lot of Buddhism over the years and visited China, Tibet, Cambodia. Uh, and so in a way, this is almost a Buddhist kind of photo out of the mud of our daily lives comes this kind of pure image, kind of a pure state of being. Next. Well, this is, you know, Death Valley. Next. Oh, this is Death Valley, again, with Scotty's castle or something in the background. But it's very similar to the dreamlike work I had done years before. Next, uh, around 1996, a friend suggested I return to gay themes, but I just didn't really want to, I'm living in California now. I just didn't want to do, you know, more male nudes. First, because everybody else was doing them and, you know, I had run out of ideas. So I began doing uh, gay couples this is a gay couple <laughs> in my own kind of strange way. Next. Uh, often as a photographer, you're always like the third person out, right? So this is really earlier from the 1970s. But again, in, instead of just being, you know, erotic gay photography, I was trying to explore states of feeling, especially amongst older gay men as I was becoming older that hadn't really been looked at before. Next. Uh, this is a gay couple in uh, Palm Springs. And often the, the relationships between the older man and the younger man uh, are very beneficial for the two of them. The younger person is often fragile or psychologically uh, distraught, and the older man has kind of more confidence and life experience, kind of a mentoring going on. Next. Oh, and uh, this is a couple breaking up. And uh, next. Again, that same feeling of a, kind of a psychodrama of a gay couple not doing so well. Again, th this is something I've never seen other people do so much. Next. Uh, interesting, uh, this is Grace Dila Volcano. She is a um, trans person. She's gone from woman to man, and that's her mother in the background. And they lived in uh, San Luis Obispo. And, uh, Again, I've really, I'm not using the wide angle anymore. I'm just coming in 
to really focus on the faces and the drama of the moment. And again, I have an extended series of gays and their parents. Next. Oh, that's my, I actually came up with a boyfriend in San Luis Obispo for a couple of years named Vince. And then his parents came to visit us and we kind of had to hide it, right? Because they were Baptists from uh, Alabama, Biloxi, wherever. And so it's an interesting psychological moment there, the mother and the father. Okay, next. This is a recent one. This is uh, the father is in the middle, the two lover and his son is on the right and the lover is on the left looking a little unhappy about the whole situation. And the father really sort of doesn't accept the situation but he's dealing with it. Next. Uh, quite often uh, older gay men are the ones who take care of the aging parents. So this is uh, San Luis Obispo. Next. Uh, this is an older gay man whose father is dying. He died the next day. He asked me to photograph him with his father. Next. Uh, this is a guy and his mother was quite ill and probably dying and she was, uh, reading a lot of books about ghosts. She, was, she had all these videos about ghosts and, you know. And so in a way, this is from around uh, the year 2000. So it kind of, I'm going back to earlier ways of working. The fantasy, the play acting, but relating in, in some ways to the themes of my work. Okay, next. Uh, I, uh, I did, I found a, a set of truck mirrors and I set them up, you, you know, they, they hang outside the uh, edges of trucks on, you see them. And I could set them up anywhere and uh, they gave me different aspects of myself. So I did a series of self-portrait as San Francisco types, you know, homeless person, hippie, businessman, veteran, I don't know what, just set them up around the city. And here I am as the aging hippie. It's kind of amusing. Next. Uh, if you remember, you know, 30 years back, there's a portrait of my father in the snow, in that chair. So this is where I was living in Cambria uh, in the field next to my house. So I set the chair up and I did a self portrait. And, you know, I'm, I'm 82 now and I'm uh, pretty, still taking a lot of pictures and enjoying things and having new adventures visually all the time. But, you know, uh, that's about all to say. Okay, if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you so much, Arthur. Um, there is a lot of love in the chat of to people that are completely amazed um, with your work. And um, there are some questions, so. Um, one person uh, was just commenting about the depth of field of the image is amazing. And so they wanted to know if, and I think it was in regards to the um, flood dreams is when that comment came up. And so they, they wanted to know if you use long exposures. No, oh, okay. No, uh, I, I never really owned a tripod. <laughs> I don't do anything. I am Mr. Minimal Equipment. But um, those early photographs, like the flood dream, were used. Uh, Hasselblad in the 1970s came out with this amazing lens called the Distagon. 
lens, a super wide angle that was sharp from far to near. So that's why it had that wonderful effect. It also had this kind of dreamlike distortion of things too. Mm. So that's the, yes. There was another question. Well, uh, folks felt that your presentation was inspiring. Um, one person was curious if your sitters saw the final photograph and what their reactions were, or if you keep in touch with them at all. Yes. Um, uh, when you, I do ask people to sign a model release, and at the bottom of the model release, it says you get one print. So I always send them a print. Obviously, people that I shoot on the street that I really don't know, but most of the time, and uh, uh, when I'm dealing with adults, mature people, I, they do get a print, and you know, a, a few of them have become friends over the years. So, okay. Uh, if they're interested. Okay, and then um, yes, this next person's question was that they were curious about the role that your physical camera plays in your interaction with the environment and subjects. You mentioned that being behind the camera puts you in a different zone than most people, and that it's the camera or being behind it. Uh, it makes you more bolder than you would be otherwise. Wondering what, uh, excuse me, wondering about that as well as your thought process as you move from observational street photography toward a more staged and creative images. Okay. Uh, so the role the physical camera plays in your interaction with the environment and subjects. Yes, uh, you know, I've, I've used the camera for so many years, it's become, I just hold it in my, it's become, I don't think about it anymore. It really is just an extension of my thought processes. And um, I don't use it to intimidate the models, you know. Usually most of my models know my photography and are kind of willing to participate you know, in this little theater piece we're creating. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not like I, I'm sneaking up on people exactly. So, uh, and it becomes kind of a game for everyone to participate in. So, and it's fun. Uh, and uh, what was the second part of the question? Oh, let me go back up to it. Um... Wondering about, um, well, the, the, fact, the fact that you said that the camera puts you in a different zone and uh, that oh. if you were behind it, that the oh, camera that, makes you more bolder than you would be otherwise. You know, I, as I say, I'm kind of a, a, a shy person normally. I used to say, uh, uh, but, when I'm involved in doing something creative, I become sort of more uh, assertive in a way, uh, or I, I open up parts of myself that I wouldn't normally reveal. That, you know, a, a lot of work, you know, I talk about children, too. as I get older now, I realize that everything I photograph really, even though it's other people, it's really a mirror reflection of myself. You could say that's your style, but you know, I'm using that, I'm using the external world to bounce myself off it. And, uh, and things that I believe in, you know, social things, political things, but also visual things, you know, I'm really into at the moment, uh, kind of a cubist, fractured, uh, visually disturbing. You know, I take a lot of pictures of houses now, but they're always at a strange angle, like they're gonna all come crashing down, which is, we're living in a very unstable world in a way. And I think my, even my new work 
here is is uh, reflective of that. Okay. Um, let me go back then uh, very quickly to finish up with that. There, uh, the other part of that was um, oh goodness, let me go back up to it. Sorry, is um, what was your thought process as you moved from the observational street photography to more stage and creative? I mean, that's oh. so different. So how did that work out for you? How did you actually make the transition? Well, as I, I, we didn't really show in this slideshow and I, I have to make a uh, book out of it. You know, I grew up in Brighton Beach, Coney Island, underneath the elevated. And it really was a world apart. It, there was a boardwalk. Coney Island was kind of going out of business. So there were a lot of abandoned fun. I mean, uh, as a teenager, you know, I came out in high school in the 50s, right? I, that, that was how I survived that was difficult. So my kind of escape was, you know, going after school with my Roloflex and wandering around these kind of, uh, abandoned neighborhoods, slums, and whatever Coney Island had become. And um, so you, it was my first sense of, even though I was kind of alienated, what you call now an outlier kid, you know, uh, it gave me a sense of power. They were very good photos. You know, I, I won a lot of uh, scholastic, you know, these little contests they have for high school students. <laughs> and so it kind of empowered me. And, but also I do think someone said about my work, well, odd, he's coming from a very odd point of view. I think the thing about being the gay teenager is that you uh, have this very kind of unusual point of view of things. You, you, you view heterosexuality and families from a different point of view. You see the stresses, stresses and hypocrisies, etc. cetera. Plus, I, anyone, I often invite sometimes photographers to come out and walk with me. I'm doing a lot of uh, urban photography again in San Mateo County. And I, I just, uh, I did a project recently called In Recess, where I photographed 125 closed schools. It was my COVID project. It was, and I photographed, it's, it's online. Uh, and uh, just wandering around these empty schools. It was, like, it was like I was back in Coney Island again. Just, you know, overturned bicycles, school books scattered, overgrown gardens, broken windows, peeling murals. It was frightening. It was apocalyptic. Uh, I'm just saying that, uh, that of my generation of gay people, they were all in the closet. You know, I went to a psychiatrist and he said, oh, it's illegal, it's a mental disease. You know, you really felt terrible about yourself. And, uh, and so, but now it's different, of course. But, uh, but you can say, but maybe that was a good thing in a way, because I hate to say, because it gave my work a certain darkness. That, okay. Um, so we have someone here. Um, that I just turned on their mic. So Claire, can you hear us and can you speak? Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. So this was such an honor to be invited to listen in to Arthur today and to speak about his work. I was part of the digitization process at Stanford about three years ago and came upon his body of work and was very surprised as I started to dig deeper through the portfolio. Um, but it was so neat to see his photographs and then to come here today and to be able to hear 
um, some of what you have to say, Arthur, about your work. So I just wanted to say thank you for allowing us to digitize the work at Stanford. It was um, truly an honor and I just really enjoyed being able to work so closely with it. And um, it's such a treat to be able to hear your words today. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have a couple more questions. Um, so um, one is, can you describe how much of your process comes from planning oh, for discovery intuition, which I think you kind of spoke about, but also um, do you make many or just a few exposures uh, to select from? Oh, can you, can we, can I show this? Yes. Okay. I have these notebooks, usually one, uh, I do one a year and I said, I'm interested in, I make the covers myself. So this is a Russian constructivist uh, woodcut. And so I, these are my picture ideas mm -hmm. I had. Uh, Just uh, I, I'm doing a lot of still lifes of puzzles that I buy on eBay, <laughs> geometric puzzles. <laughs> so it all goes in and and um, uh, so I kind of write down all these strange ideas. So th there is a lot of pre-production. I guess that is pre-production time where I think of the ideas, I get them there. And then somehow like the nightmare photo, you see, then I just walking around. I, I do invite photographers to take walks with me. And then I just get into a different zone. And then I see things that they will never see. I said, oh, look at that, isn't that strange? Oh, move that over there. <laughs> They're amazed that <laughs> I, I see all these things that they're not aware of. I'm, I'm not to boast, but it's just, I'm just somewhere else, but it's, it's already packed in my head. Okay. And I kind of conjure them up. Hmm. Okay. Um, somebody commented that, um, that um, Henry Cartier-Bresson yeah. Um, mastered the design inside the rectangle with the standard lens and that you have certainly mastered the square format yes, the subject I, background with slightly wide angle uh, yeah. uh, lens. The question is, how is the square format and slightly wide angle lens significant and does it enhance the surreal geometry? Uh, well, the, the super wide angle lens, which I use mostly for the dream collector, I stopped using it after shadow. Now I just use a regular lens. Maybe with a portrait, I might use it. Uh, uh, again, it gave you this very unusual sense of uh, bringing the distance and the near together, you know, so you could have, you know, uh, and kind of put everything in the center of the picture. So uh, I, uh, that, that was good for that particular project. Okay. And what was the question again? Um, well, if, um... The square format and slightly wide angle lens even enhances the surreal geometry. Yes, exactly. So, uh, but then actually, I, I felt that all my pictures were looking the same because with this wide angle lens, and that the lens was making the photo, not me. Mm. So I gave myself the challenge of using the normal lens. Uh, to make interesting photos. And so the rest of my photography since then has been with a regular, maybe a telephoto 
because I'm doing architecture a lot. But uh, um, yeah. someone wanted to know how you gain the confidence of your subjects. Oh, again, um, uh, I show them my work beforehand. You know, usually they, they know my work. I, I usually, I, I've uh, published a few books and I, they, I'll show them the book and I said, you know, I'm gonna, and I always get, uh, I do have a say, you know, I'd like you to pose, like, but I will ask you to sign a model release before we do the shoot. And so once they sign that model release, they're giving me consent in a way. Okay. To photograph them. And, and they know, people know that it's not gonna be a flatter, necessarily flattering. <laughs> I might be probing some secret hidden things that you know, every relationship kind of has in a way within it. Uh, somebody wanted to know if you have a lot of interaction with your subjects, like because you uh, to get the intense facial expressions, or does someone come up with their own expressions more spontaneously when you shoot them? Uh, well, uh, I don't. I don't really get to know my. Mo I try not to know my models very well. It's not. I'm not photographing an encounter with my model. You know, like we're going to talk for hours about this and that, and then I'm going to photograph. No. Sometimes they're relative strangers. And uh, again, so I intuit things, I guess, but also most of the time, you know, like childhood therapy where you give a kid some little dolls and he has them acting out. I used to do a lot of puppet plays when I was a kid, right? So I'm using these people in my own psychodramas. Okay. So I'm projecting a lot of, of my angst and disturbance upon them. There are not a lot of smiling pictures and tress, <laughs> smiling faces and tress images. Where, where, Ron, you smile a lot. You may photograph people with smiling faces because that's a projection of you. Sorry, <laughs> you know. I get it, I get it. Um, somebody wanted to know if, if everything you're shooting is film-based or if you're shooting anything using a digital camera now? No, ha don't have a digital camera. Okay. Sorry. I, I think my next project in color, you no, know, digital is wonderful for color, you know, cause it has, it's so easy. And so I think if I, I'm going to segue into a color, but for right now, I'm happy with my Tri-X film. It's just what I'm used to. It's, it's really not, uh, analog really isn't, sharper or better than digital now. I mean, digital cameras are actually superior, I think, to analog cameras. Um, so there was a lot of love just saying thank you for the stories behind the images. They really yeah. enjoy the evocative and mysterious feeling that your images portray. Um, was and then there's another question. And then a question is: Was the image with the sheep inspired by the model's name, Bob Leet? Um, no. Okay. B, B Leet, you know, or Bleet? No. Again, uh, it, I, I've noticed that too. Bob Leet with sheep, but um, it was just that he had it in his apartment, you know, and I was edging, you know. Uh, I say this as a joke, you know, years ago, I was really too shy to ask someone to take off their shirt, their t-shirt. But once I got into doing uh, the male nude, it became a very interesting area of exploration. Uh, okay. Um, okay, hang on, so there's a couple uh, more. Did you ever meet or work with 
Fakir Musafar. Who? Sorry. Fakir Musafar. No, I don't know their work. Okay. Um, okay. We'll move on then. Um, okay. Okay, hang on a second. Um, okay, so people are just loving the presentation. Did you ever encounter some criticism from, from other photographers for asking your subjects to pose? Oh, uh, again, you know, the Gary Winogrand, uh, Lee Friedlander, uh, that whole school of photographers were very defensive about their territory. You know, that was the, that was the way of shooting. You know, there was the Museum of Modern Art and that was the only kind of photography that they would show because somehow it was, you know, Ansel Adams, it's called straight photography, right? And that was the only way to go. And that's what photography, cameras, cameras were good at reproducing reality. You know, weren't supposed to be too personal, you know. And so they were very strong in defending their turf. They got the Guggenheims, they got the museum exhibitions. Uh, obviously it did change beginning in the eighties as uh, people had a more, wider view of what photography could become. Dwayne Michaels said you could write with, when Dwayne Michaels began writing on his photos, that was a controversy. You should see what was, you know, you can't do that. You know, the, you can't tell people what to think about your photo. You can't paint on your photos. Even though there's a whole history of photography about that, about manipulated images, uh, theatrical images, it, it was written out of, photo history. It was a no-no. So there was some pushback, but I think Dwayne Michaels, Jerry Ullisman, uh, there was a whole group of photographers that just said, we don't want to do that anymore. That's ridiculous. <laughs> we have someone um, on our presentation today that is a huge fan of your work and she says her all-time favorite photo is Mosque Agra, India from 1966. Oh, yeah. And would would and was asking if you could sort of comment about it. Okay, it's very interesting. Number one, if you go online and you put in search. Arthur Tress blur books, and you go to blur books. <laughs> I have like 35 blur books. Uh, and I have one on India, my trip to India. And uh, uh, my last year at college, at Bard College, uh, th th there was the Vietnam War. So the way you avoided the Vietnam War was to get out of the country. So I traveled for several years. But my first trip was to uh, Southern Mexico where I began photographing uh, my, my first uh, tribal group. I lived for a couple of months with the Mayan Indians. It's a, I made a blur book out of it. Uh, and it got me very interested in tribal people. And so uh, since I was out of the country, I began doing a lot of ethnographical, and that was my first job for the Ethnographical Museum in Stockholm. And I went through Africa and I did the Dogon, different tribal groups, and I'd write about them for Swedish school children and uh, making documentaries. Whole point is, I was in India going to visit the Toda people, but I stopped off at the, in Agra. So that, that, was just, we don't really know what that building was. It was just a building in the middle of the Jumna River near the Taj Mahal. And it was just early morning and uh, the 
it's a wonderful photograph in, in a way. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for that information. Oh, but the thing is, my ethnographical studies, you know, uh, tribal people live in a world where there isn't so much difference between the level of reality and the upper region and the underworld. They're all kind of mixing together. And, and I think what I learned from tribal people through their myths and and folk tales and rituals and ceremonies uh, was that our lives are kind of interconnected on these three levels. Uh, and also past and future are very flattened. So my data work really draws on that kind of ethnographical research in a way. Themes. Okay, anything else? That is all the questions. So thank you so much, Arthur. This has been a treat for all of us. And you continue to make amazing work. And the fact that you spent time sharing it with, uh, with us at Foothill, and we had so many guests that joined us from different okay. parts of the country and or world. So you have a lot of fans out there, as you know, and they brought with them a lot of love here today. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You are an inspiration for us all. Another thing, on YouTube, there are a lot of videos of me making photos and on Vimeo also. There's me and Coney Island. <laughs> so you can see how, see how I work, actually. It's we'll be sure to check them out. Thank you all for joining us and enjoy the rest of the day. All Thank right. you. Indeed.